Hello, hello, this is Patty Jo. We're on day four. People are telling me I'm losing it in the comments. They're probably right. And it's not going to get any better, I know that. Um, because Daryl just gets worse and worse with his cycle of narcissist craziness. Like, his entitled... Oh my gosh, I used to call college students that, I'm sorry. But just... You know, the age difference became really obvious to me. But his cycle of when he doesn't get his way, oh, first of all, the obnoxious fake objections, just interruptions and petulant behavior. And then when he doesn't get his way, devolving to a temper tantrum, pretty soon we're going to see more getting removed, I think, because that's going to escalate. Um... He really doesn't have a defense, does he? He doesn't have a defense at all. I mean, he's not even trying. I, f I hate saying this, but I feel like, because I hate saying I feel like, but I have no real educated knowledge. I feel like, and I wonder if you guys do too, that he just thinks he's this, that the whole thing is like a TV lawyer situation. And the fact of the matter is, is these people who are lawyers, they think differently. I think I've said this in the past. My sister took, try or well, was going to attempt to take the LSATs, and she started taking, like, a, a prep for it. And these questions made zero sense to me. I think in a doctor medical term. It's even different from nursing. Paramedics are different from nurses. I have both education, so I, I know this. Okay. And meaning I, I have finished a nursing program, a college nursing program. So I, I do know this. Nurses are taught to think differently from paramedics. Paramedics and nurses are taught to think differently from attorneys. We just, I mean, if you can think that way, you've got multiple brain cells that I don't have. But Lawyers are taught to think in, wow, ways that are just make you think differently. They, they think differently. They, they, they approach it and think differently. That's how they can analyze legal arguments. That's how they do it because they think that way. So his questions don't help him. Mm. All right. So here we are, day four. I think I've got it primed up right to the beginning, right when she just says that she's calling the case. She's kind of in the middle of the sentence. So I'm getting better at getting those right where I want it. Case number 21 CF 1848 may I have the appearances, please. Oh, God, here we go. Already. Uh, did, it, did it jump back? That's okay. Here we go. Because she's going to call for the appearances. And I think that's where everybody introduces themselves for the record. And of course, the state does a proper job and, and they're very dignified about it. And Daryl does his whole little speech, his sobsit speech. <laughs> I always used to go to work. When I worked for the fire department, I always used to go in thinking, I'm not going to have a bad attitude, and I'm going to have a good attitude. I'm not going to say any swear words today. And it wouldn't be 10 minutes, and I would be, what the heck? And then the, the string of swear words is this person actually calling for? Like, really, what, what do they want me to do for this? I actually had somebody call me because they had an ingrown toenail. That's not a medical emergency. Even if it's infected, go, go to, you know, urgent care and get it cut. I don't know. They, I don't even know if they would do it there. Oh, bless. All right. So, yeah, this jumped back. But let's let it roll. So every day I would go in and I would say, ah. Okay, there we go. We'll just going to say it. State of Wisconsin versus... Daryl E. Brooks, case number 21, CF 1848. May I have the appearances, please? Yeah. Good morning, Judge. Two 
Leslie Basie and Zach Wichow appearing for the state of Wisconsin. Dignified. Sir, please state your name for the record. I'm here as a third party intervener, intervener in that matter, appearing as authorized representative for my client. I accept for value and return for value all of the charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption available for discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts in these charging instruments and I do not consent to or agree to being called their name. At one point, I tried looking up each and every one of those pieces of word salad, I think is what everybody calls it online. And none of it has any real or true meaning in an actual courtroom. A lot of it is civil or federal trying to, and if he doesn't dispute anything, isn't he just saying, oh, there he goes, and uh, for my client, <laughs> the, he who shall not be named. <laughs> oh my God, Talk that's a good one. To reflect that the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks uh, is appearing in person in custody. He is also in civilian or street clothing, in a suit and tie, also wearing a mask. Mr. Brooks, I know today you're also not wearing headsets. I just want to make a record yesterday. Um, they were offered to you, uh, even charged. Uh, the different charging unit was um, I don't know provided. if that's too low. I did not see you wearing the uh, headset at any point in time. Um, and from my perspective, given your um, either legal arguments made, comments to the court, or questioning of witnesses uh, that you were able to hear, um, but I just feel it important given that you raised that issue uh, to put that on the record. I do want to address uh, the case law that was filed by Mr. Brooks. Um, I have a question, sir, because um, you had indicated there was this United States v. Lopez. I had looked up a case. I don't know if it's the one that you were referring to. I asked you if it was from 1995, you thought it was. Have you been able to look through your documents to tell me which United States versus Lopez you were referring? Okay, everybody vote. He's gonna say no because Daryl doesn't think he should have to do his own homework. He thinks the judge should have to do his homework. So, I vote no. Let's see what he says. Um, I have not, but I also uh, cited Hagen's versus Levine as well, 415 yes, U.S. 533, or I think you may have corrected I was able that. to find Hagen's versus Levine and uh, Malo versus United States. Um, I also found um, a case that is uh, captioned uh, United States versus Lopez um, at... 514 U.S. 549, that's a case from, um, it was decided in 1995, it had to do with the, in part, uh, with the, um, you know, it had to do with uh, a provision in the federal statutes regarding the gun safe free zone and whether that was constitutional or not. Um, it was a criminal case, but nonetheless, that was one of the major issues in that case. So I don't know if that's the case you were referring or not. Um, and without a citation, it's hard for me to know. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking you if you have any other information yeah. about that case. Um, I can possibly look on a break uh, but my understanding, uh, understanding of that particular case was um, dealing with the specifics of uh, subject matter and personal jurisdiction. And personal which jurisdiction. Is why, um, it was brought up. Should you need a personal jurisdiction? Which is something that I have even, been doing. He even speaks like a toddler, like with the slur, and you can't really understand all the words. Ugh. Adamantly is asking for the court to provide adamantly verified proof. Don't try to use big words, Daryl. Which I have not been provided with. You can't yet. spell it. Don't use it. 
court's not required to do that, sir. I understand what your objection is. It's been noted for the record multiple times um, in the previous rulings of the court stand. I see no reason to revisit those issues or what we call legally um, a motion for reconsideration. Even if I were to take your reference to these cases as a request to reconsider based on um, a new legal argument, um, the cases that I reviewed um, don't support that. Um, I do want to give the state an opportunity to at least make a record uh, as to their position, and then I'll give you the last word if you want to um, make a legal argument to the contrary. I do. I do. I want. I want the last word, and I want that last word to be the ruling. Yes. Um, <laughs> Your Honor, I did review the U.S. versus Lopez, the um, Lopez case that you said at five fourteen U.S. five four nine. Basie's answering. He's toast. He's toast because even Sue Offer knows as good as she is. She, this lady is the detail girl. I love her. I would, you know, I had a student like that who I honestly would love to have this guy just proofread my stuff just to make sure. Just to make sure. Because <laughs> he was that good. She's that good. Ugh. As the court already indicated, it deals with the Gun-Free School Zone Act, which is a federal offense. The court found that the that Congress exceeded um, its authority under the Commerce Clause, and therefore um, there was no jurisdiction. I don't find any analogy between that case and this case. Again, I'm not sure if that is the Lopez case that the defendant was referring to. Okay, so what I hear is he he cited a case where, okay, gun-free zones. I, I live near a big, really violent city, worked in that violent city. So I saw these no-shoot zones, and, you know, the no-shoot zone in our city got shot, ironically, I think by the police after he tried to stab his girlfriend. But I digress. Um so I guess that case, what I hear is they tried to say that that was unconstitutional to have a, a gun-free zone near schools because it's unconstitutional because of the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. And that which I agree with, and I think what the aim of the whole no gun zone around those areas was to decrease school shootings or shootings around schools and around children, which... You know, I think we've all fully support without, you know, taking away other people's rights. Unfortunately, the people who are doing these shootings aren't bearing arms legally. <laughs> They're stealing them and killing people. With them. So, um, you know, going about it in that way just kind of wasn't the way. But, you know, that's my idea of the case. But yes, um, a federal case has to prove it has jurisdiction over the, the law in the area, I mean, the Tenth Amendment says that we can, in the state, make different laws, you know, that suit us. So, you know, you can say it's unconstitutional, but maybe they can't. I don't know. Thank I don't you. know. That's, see? With well, lawyers think differently. United States, this was a, a case involving an accident um, that the plaintiff had with the um, an employee of the U.S. Postal Service who was driving a U.S. Postal truck, and the issue became whether Federal. or not there was a valid claim against uh, the U.S. Postal Service um, as a result of a claim filed against the employee, um, and the court held that there was not, and therefore jurisdiction was not conferred um, to the United States um, again. Okay, so again, that's a federal case. First of all, did everybody know you can have local statutes saying, but for pullover laws, um, for like ambulance and fire service and even police, I guess. But yes, they have statutes, but federally, legally, those vehicles are requesting that you yield your right of way. That is how EVOC works. EVOC is our class that we hold nationally for all of the emergency um, medical drivers for uh, vehicle drivers. So 
you are we are requesting your you to yield your right of way. And that being said, a postal truck, which is federal, they don't have to request. They can actually demand you do it. Now, then again, local statutes will say pull over laws. And, you know, when you hear a siren pull over to the right or do whatever it is you're going to do, usually it's just drive around and panic and drive in front of the things and swerve all over the place. But and then slow down. So they can't go by you. That's usually what happens. But, you know, people do the best they can. Whatever. I never really was was bent out of shape over that. But if a federal truck, like if the federal, like the U.S. Postal Service truck hits you and you're a pedestrian, I suppose, that is this case. They wanted to sue the Postal Service as well as the, the driver. And I don't think that's how it where I think they blocked that. But... Federally, there was no jurisdiction. It was a local issue. And not a case Again, federal. A this is not federal. With any issue that's been raised in this case. And finally, I understand Higgins her. versus Levine at 415 U.S. 533. Again, this is one in which the um, district court was found to have had jurisdiction to hear the plaintiff's claim. It was a case in which um, a New York, uh, state of New York, uh, regulation address New York's ability to recoup some payments from AFDC, I believe. And uh, there was a claim that that violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, the court did find that the district court did have jurisdiction to hear the plaintiff's claim. Again, I did not find any verbiage from any of these three cases that would um, raise any, any type of argument in this case that this court does not have jurisdiction to hear this case. Thank you, Mr. Brooks, your response. Okay, so as we all know, if you commit an offense, criminal, or even jurisdictional defense, uh, offense, like a traffic offense, or you know, you peed on the sidewalk or something, oh, I don't know, um, that jurisdiction is, is held wherever you did it okay so if i drive to another state and speed that's an offense in that state that state has jurisdiction over me what these clowns say is that it's got some kind of weird civil spin to it and they're and since and they don't really but i don't understand that how can you not be held accountable but then want to hold other people accountable to you, like how can they have a fee schedule for the government to stop them if they don't recognize them? Why do you even stop? If you're sovereign, why do you even show up at court? Don't. Like, if you truly believe and had, you know, belief in your convictions, you wouldn't do that. Okay, let's hear Daryl. I can't wait. Come on, Daryl. Don't let us down. Yeah, I, I respectfully object to that. Uh, it's, G it's clear. It's clear. In, in both of those cases, that ultimately those cases were called correct by the correct. Supreme Court, and that both correct. cases ended up being voided because voided. there was no jurisdiction. Um, oh, God. Same thing in this case. How I, how it applies is this court has yet to prove that. It has jurisdiction. It has it has not been proven. There's been uh, it, no certified document. She didn't even away. need to. Oh. Um, there's been no proof. There's been no response to the uh, demand for the statement of particulars. There's been um, no response. Then he's going off to, track. Uh, Judge Doral, she she nailed that one. I mean, we haven't even established that <sighs> the plaintiff is. A living human being and not an entity. That's civil. Um, That's civil. There are so many things that have yet to even be proven. We are the people and who again, you offended. If both cases that were just cited were voided by the Supreme voided. Court. Voided. They're not voided. For lack of jurisdiction, how is this case any different? It's criminal. 
you offended the, the people of the state of Wisconsin? The Higgins and the Milo decisions or Melo. Um, these were civil lawsuits. They weren't criminal cases at all. They dealt go. with civil. the issue of uh, a federal question or federal claims and jurisdiction in the district court for those particular uh, cases. Um, there's nothing that's applicable to a criminal case in state court uh, for this court to even find their relevant. Uh, they may be case law, maybe law as it relates to that, but they're not relevant to the proceedings in this case. Thank you. Um, in the Malo decision, for example, that had to do with a lack of jurisdiction because the plaintiff had failed to exhaust administrative remedies. That's not something that's applicable here. And so in that case, the court did not have jurisdiction. Um, in the Hagen's case, again, it had to do with a federal claim and jurisdiction related to that uh, and not criminal charges brought by a state uh, against a individual. The Lopez decision, while a criminal case dealt with a federal law and whether the district court had jurisdiction, in Lopez, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down a federal statute that had made an offense criminal, and because of that, there was no jurisdiction. There have been no similar arguments made in this case at all. The arguments that you raise related to the Bill of Particulars, related to um, those types of issues. Um, not to interrupt the good judge, but in my understanding, Bill of Particulars is basically the, the criminal complaint. It's the list of things he did, Bill of Particulars, right? Um, have all been debunked throughout the ages in the courts of the United States of America, both in state court and in federal court. And I direct your attention once again to United States versus Benneby, 654 F. 3rd, 753. It's a 2011 decision oh. uh, from the Seventh Circuit. That's, uh, that is that's a load of credit. Point. Um, as to the arguments that you are Darryl, raising. So there's no requirement for this court to do what you are asking or demanding it to do. Uh, and for all of those reasons, this court will deny your request to dismiss, uh, deny your request for uh, the demand for particulars, um, even going back to one of the filings from the third dealing with your demand for a verified statement, your notice of special appearance. I mean, all of those things have been noted on the record, uh, but to the extent that the court needs to respond to any of those, once again, uh, your demands and requests and objections are either overruled or denied as the case may be. Your Honor, may I respectfully request a legal reconsideration for your ruling? No, I just went through my reasoning, sir. So without uh, you meeting the standard under uh, a motion for reconsideration under Section 806.07, uh, that request is summarily denied without any further argument. All right, with for record, that. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling? As you she just gave cited, it. Your Honor. I just uh, provided the legal ba basis. Sir. Thank you. You just cited a, a, a case law from United States versus Venneby, correct? Um, my reasoning stands, the record before you and on the record speaks for itself. I'm not going to address this any further. Your objections are made. Respectfully, Your Honor, may, may I ask for a written judicial finding of fact no. and conclusion of law in this matter? The record stands for itself. You may request that request is denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for an interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter. She would have to go to the appeals court. That is not an issue this court would address. That would be for an appellate court, sir. Record, may I move to stay these proceedings until this instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction? She can deny that. Um, that request is denied. This is a court of competent jurisdiction. Based, on, we'll what, based on what law or fact, Your Honor? All right, Mr. Brooks, your objections are noted. I want to keep moving forward today. Uh, respectfully. May I respectfully object to that, Your Honor, based on... He who shall not be named third-party intervener 
actually thought he was going to go home based on this ridiculous argument. He actually thought he was going to go home yesterday when he brought this stuff up. They were just going to say, oh, thank goodness, the high school dropout. He, he brought us this information and now we see clearly <laughs> the law. <laughs> we now see clearly. Daryl, you're not trying to get a traffic ticket dismissed or, you know, these offsets. I won in court. No, they just didn't want to deal with you. They, they just, they didn't want you. They don't want you anymore. You, you're costing them more fighting the ticket, which I actually disagree with. I think we should have a special sob sit ticket court for them. <laughs> Let them go and stand in line right right there and argue jurisdiction all day long and just rotate that line and let those tickets just build up and then can just have suspended license until it happens i would even go for a suspended license on any ticket that you don't take care of based on that because i think most of us would take care of our tickets and just not have to worry about it the law would be meaningless. It's kind of like a seatbelt law. It's a meaningless law to me because I put my seatbelt on. I don't care. I don't want. I don't want to die. I ride a motorcycle, so when I'm in a car, I put a seatbelt on. Um, wow. He thought he was going. Look at him thinking he was going to go home. He's going to throw a fit. The fact I think he's going to throw a fit. That was a, a federal law, and then. That's what you were trying to. That's what you were trying to do. You were. Trying to, he's trying to work me up, guys. Went over in the challenge of jurisdiction. Trying to work me up. Dealing with federal guidelines. This court's not going to explain the law to you, sir. Um, I've cited the law, um, but I just direct you to those decisions. I believe they speak for themselves, and um, your request for any further. Articulation by this court as to the basis for the court's decision. Denied. Tonight. Thank may you. I, may I respect no. the object, Your Honor? Yes, and, object. And still ask for a verified proof. No. Of. Mr. Brooks, I've already addressed that the request is denied. She is the verified proof. She is the verified proof. If we, you guys are telling me that I'm getting all worked up, you're right. She is the verified proof. If you have an argument with your neighbor, so this is civil, I get that. But if you have an argument with your neighbor, you go to court. If you don't agree with your speeding ticket, you go to court. The judge is the verified proof or the jury. That's the verified proof. That's the verified proof. Who do you want to verify the proof, Daryl? Who? Who gets to verify? All right, moving on. Uh, moving on. Moving on. Mr. Brooks, thank you. He's going to throw a fit. He's going to throw a fit. Attorney Opera, I'd like to address the issue. <laughs> your You've already on. did. Um, I would like to address the issue of the subpoenas that were turned over to the state. If you could oh, here we go. Yes, thank you. We have received. <sighs> Again, I'm so sorry. The subpoenas. Okay, so for, for Prince, he who shall not be named, third party intervener icky little man, aka, um, the state is going to serve his subpoenas. They're going to help him do this. They're going to take his halfway crayon drawn window licked statements or subpoenas and, and try to funnel them into something. Okay. But he, he who shall not be named icky little man thinks he's Perry Mason or whoever, the guy from, you know, whatever law show he, he's been imagining that he's in. He thinks he, he's going to, he's going to trick him. He's going to show him. He's got, he's got something they don't have. Believe me, nobody does. This is the team. This team here makes me wonder how Manitowoc, which is very close to this area, went so wrong with the Avery case back in the 80s. Not the one where he was rightfully convicted of the tragic and terrible murder that he committed after he got out. But back in the 80s, 
that's where Minnetowoc went wrong. So where they went dumb, these people, these, these they're superstars. Shoot, okay. These subpoenas that were uh, provided by Mr. Brooks, I believe there were 12 in total. Uh, we are endeavoring to have uh, all the individuals properly served, and we will um, assist in arranging their appearance here in the courtroom at the appropriate time, with the exception of that one individual who we believe has relocated to the state of Texas. Um, uh, there are no other concerns that the state has at this point in getting those subpoenas served and getting these uh, people here. I do want to uh, advise the court that one of the witnesses on Mr. Brooks' uh, subpoena list does need a Spanish interpreter. And that also reminds me to update the court on our progress in that regard. Um, the, for the state's case... Okay, now almost, I think almost all of, if not all, of his witnesses on his list were people that the state had on a potential list that they dropped. So they may have had, I don't know how many they did have, but let's say they had 15 and they're only calling 10. Daryl took the last five. That's what he did. So however many the state had on their original list, um, they took a certain number. Daryl scooped up the rest and or doubled up like the Erica Patterson situation and one of the other um, uh, officers. He scooped them because he thought if the state doesn't want them, they must have information that's going to help me. And I hate, I'm not saying this because I think Spanish speaking people are less intelligent in any way. In fact, I have found that the Spanish speaking population, Spanish only speaking population in the area that I served were some of the sweetest, nicest, most generous, smartest business people that I have ever seen. And I took a lot of example from that. Always tried to learn how to be bilingual. And I don't have either the patience or the capability or maybe a combination of both. But it's likely they did not want that particular witness because it costs the court money to get an interpreter. And it probably costs a lot of money. So if that's the case and you have all these other witnesses that don't need the expense of an interpreter who can cover the same information that this person has, unless they have some sort of bombshell that, that the prosecution needs, which they don't, okay, because not only are they making their case, but Daryl is making their case, um, they don't really need the expense of the interpreter. So then here comes Daryl. So, oh, he must know something. I don't even think he understands what it's going to take to get an interpreter to get this adequately, you know, because a lot of these people don't speak Spanish. So they're not going to be able to know what he's saying. So interpreters are expensive in this area because I know they're expensive in the medical area too. I should tell you the story of what the fire department gave the fire department gave us these laminated papers with the medical questions that we would ask, you know, do you have any allergies? Do you know, where does it hurt? Stuff like that. What's your history? And they, they had it spelled out even phonetically nicely enough in Spanish so that we could try to say it to the patient. But then the patient would think that we spoke Spanish and they would start prattling off in Spanish very quickly what the answers to those questions were. And we'd be like, what? So, yeah, it was silly. It was so bad. <laughs> it was so bad. We, we looked so dumb. We would need a Spanish interpreter and it's still unknown to us or uncertain, I should say. Uh It'd be later tomorrow morning, like probably after the morning break or even after lunch. We could call these witnesses out of order if we had to. So if you want to just say possibly 1 p.m. tomorrow, we could certainly 
work around that. So, um, and then, so in other words, one of Daryl's biggest things is he doesn't want them to know when he's going to call and what his, how his defense is going to be laid out. But for this particular witness, the whole court has to know when they're going to be called so that the interpreter can work. He who shall not be named. Have you been in contact with the individual making arrangements for the interpreter since it is the court's responsibility to do that, but it's your request? I know my assistant had spoken to someone in the clerk's office. Uh, I think it was last week. I don't know if there's been any recent contact, but I will ask her to do that today. And Daryl says he's not getting a fair trial. How much more fair can you be? They're helping him. Um, and I don't see that person here today, but... Yeah, I um, saw him also. I think he just came in to observe for a while. Okay. Uh, can you tell me the name of the uh, witness for Mr. Brooks that needs an interpreter? Juan Marquez, M-A-R-Q-U-E-Z. And this, can you just give me a little bit more background? What I'm contemplating is because I need to make arrangements for the interpreter is perhaps we could have that person brought the same time the other witness needs an interpreter and do those witnesses, At the depending same time. on how long they take. It may or may not be back to back, but maybe there'd be a witness in between um, just for court efficiency and uh, to make sure we have an interpreter available. Yes, I understand, and we could potentially call him out of order. He is in the group with the same group that we would need Spanish interpreters for. That would be the Catholic community of Waukesha. So we're projecting to get to that testimony tomorrow morning for our case. Uh, as we sit here right now, Judge, we don't think we're going to need an interpreter, but we want to uh, reserve that right should the, should the need arise. And uh, Mr. Marquez was on our witness list. However, we had in, uh, made a preliminary decision that we would not be calling him as a witness. So he's generally familiar with the court proceedings and he knows he may be called to testify. In other words, they talk to this gentleman who doesn't speak either good English or English at all. And as a potential witness, and he had probably had similar in line because he was probably standing right next to or very close to another person who spoke better English. They chose to go with that person because of probably the cost, quite frankly. But explaining to both of them, these potential witnesses, the process, they're both intelligent people and they both understand. So, in other words, another thing they're helping Daryl with. Um, Darryl. So it would be tomorrow morning Ugh. and yes, maybe we just want to say one o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the interpreter's here for whatever witness <sighs> needs them and we call Mr. Marquez out of order. It wouldn't be a great uh, switch for the jury because we'll already have been dealing with those facts tomorrow morning. When do you think you'll know whether you will need an interpreter? Is that for a witness or for someone in attendance? Yeah, no, it's uh, after our first two witnesses as it relates to the Catholic community. We believe we can um, establish all the elements we need through those witnesses. But if for some reason we could not, then we would have to call some of the Spanish speaking uh, people. See, we I was right. Would be prepared to go on with other witnesses, and then we may have to circle back if, if need be. But we understand we and want it's, to be it's, it's and not anything. Downtime. It's not anything other than a language barrier. It's a language barrier. It does not mean that these people are less intelligent, or maybe that we're less intelligent. Really, we are a little bit if we're not able to be. That's what I heard. I heard that people who are able to be by our multilingual actually are smarter than people who cannot, which just makes me think I'm just not smart enough. I'm just not smart enough. So 
I tried. All right. Thank you. I'm contemplating. <coughs> I've tried Babel. That uh, since Rosetta the Stone. you want as part of that group, and there's a possibility that uh, they will need an interpreter. Um, if that's the situation, then I'm going to require that Mr. Marquez be produced at that point for questioning. You'll be questioning him first since it would be your witness, but uh, I want to make use of wise use of our resource as it relates to the interpreter. Um, it can be challenging to schedule interpreters, especially on a last minute basis. Um, I know the clerk's office has been working with the DA's office based upon the request that was received. The latest information I have, before I get back to you, Mr. Brooks, is that um, Kevin from the clerk's office has, has made a call, but it was not returned. So perhaps you can have your assistant, that was last week, follow up just to make sure um, we're all on the same page. Sure. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brooks, any questions about what I've advised you? Oh, God. The interpreter? Does that change your decision at all to call the witness? Um, it doesn't change uh, me wanting to call the witness, and I want to state for the record that I object to being called their name. Oh. I'm a living and breathing human being. No, you're not. Um, Prove it. I do have questions. Prove it. Um, that hasn't been proven like jurisdiction. <laughs> oh, my God. I've lost it. You're well aware that oh God, you really be here. once we went off the record yesterday, I stayed to complete um, all of the uh, subpoenas. Okay. There, there, so. were, there were initially 13, and I believe I turned in 12 because the prosecution stated that maybe one of them had relocated, but there was just a little bit more clarification that I didn't have yesterday about that whole situation. If they relocated or how that would play into them being subpoenaed. Um, so. Is there a question as it relates to that? No. Or just you're well, making that record. I'm making that record. And also, I, I wasn't sure yesterday, and maybe I should have asked before we went off the record. Should I have just turned in all 13 subpoenas that I had and then just wait to see what would have, what more information could have been learned from that? You can certainly give them the 13th subpoena and we can make a further record later if need be. Um, so, and we'll go from there. I mean, obviously as officers of the court, they're telling me that they have this information um, about a witness being out of state. There's a, a different procedure for obtaining a witness that is from out of state, including um, that the person calling that witness needs to make the travel arrangements, and that's in the uh, rules of procedure. So that he um, didn't read. to you if you want to turn that one over uh, so that it's officially one that you turned over, given that we, you had been given that information, and then the subpoenas needed to be refilled or filled out again. Um, I'm certainly uh, willing to have that turned over to them and at a later point, a further record can be made if needed. Um, if in the event that that takes place, would it be the same procedure, me having to stay after, or how would it work from that point? Because I, I would essentially say it would make more sense to just fill them out all together and file them together so everything is just together. It makes it easier. Just the one? Just the one? Yes. Do you need another form? Um, I have another form. All right. Do you have a copy of the first time you filled it out so you have some of that information readily at your fingertips? I, I believe I do. Um, I, I don't, believe I, don't I do. I want to say I'm 100% sure I would have to do some minimal looking through all the papers. Minimal. I have the first <laughs> batch of subpoenas <laughs> on my table <laughs> and, my and I can bring that out. I'm pretty sure it's if it's not in the paperwork that's in front of me, it's in one of these boxes, which, as you see, is a lot of paperwork. Um, I'm, I'm positive that it's there. I would just have to. Well, let me know on a break. Like I said, I have it readily available and certainly can give it back to you to look at. All right. Uh, what about the, um, did you hear me advise you about the interpreter and making arrangements and yeah. potentially calling your witness out of order because of that? Uh, yeah, I think I think that was pretty clear. No. Good. 
Just want you to be no. prepared for the possibility that tomorrow you may need to in other words, call that witness. In other words, he didn't understand the question. Look at him. <laughs> He didn't understand the question. That's why he said something about something that made no connection. I love how Judge Dora went right back to the topic. The witness oh. will be made available, and you may need to question that witness tomorrow. So I just want you to be prepared for that. So that should be the first witness called? It would be out of order. It would still be during the state's case in chief. But if, if we have the interpreter here... Um, because they need it, because they're not clear yet if they need that interpreter or not. If they use the interpreter and the interpreter's here, um, and then I'm gonna also ask that they make arrangements to have Mr. Marquez available so that the interpreter, um, we can wisely use the interpreter res uh, resource and call those individuals, if not back to back, um, uh, within short order of one another. Sometimes we have to give the interpreter a break and a rest. So, that's why it might not be back to back, but in any event, you should be prepared potentially to question that witness. If they don't call the interpreter and the interpreter's not here and we haven't made arrangements, then I'm gonna work with my staff and the clerk's office to make sure uh, we have an interpreter during your uh, case. You'll just need to tell me where in the 12 you want to call that person so I can better schedule. In the 13. Well, you have 13, but one's an out of state, so I'm told, but all right. Very good. <laughs> All right. Anything else from the state? You're not included, Daryl. That's it for today, Your Honor. Not in the club. Anything oh, other God, than what we talked about? Oh God, please. Oh God, don't ask. Yeah. Um. <sighs> I don't know if the uh, clerk received uh, two ICF forms that I submitted. I don't know if anything. I can check my electronic uh, inbox. Let me just do that. So instead of just saying what it is that he wants to know. He makes a big production out of this inmate communication form. And every day I'm noticing that he comes up with a new thing that he thinks is gonna break the case apart and he'll get to go home and take a shower. I don't know, Planet Fitness or wherever he takes a shower because he don't have a home. Ugh. And see if there's anything. Well, one one well, of the ICS we just addressed, you. that would be the one that I filled out last night, coming back from the proceedings yesterday. We just addressed that. That was dealing with the subpoenas. Okay. Okay. Right, I don't see it. Um, I'll make sure uh, that my staff knows to look for it, and when we get it, it'll be uploaded and then we can address it at, uh, at a break. The other one was dealing with the- uh, He didn't want her to ask. Asking for uh, my my court docket sheet. Docket, my docket sheet. What what even is that? What do you mean? Yeah, she don't know either. She doesn't, she, she doesn't have any clue what he's doing. Okay, so let's look at this. Court docket sheet. Sheet. And why would I be asking for that? Court okay. This report. This report allows you. To access the docket sheet for a particular case, should you choose to view the docket documents in either chronological or reverse chronological order, oh, you just—it's just the the case. Aren't you sitting there? Lord, Lord have mercy. By that sir. Uh, I would like a certified copy of the court docket sheet. I need to know what you mean by that, sir. There's many documents in the record. Um, there are so it's the record. entries that are part of the electronic file. Um, is, the, is the entire, uh, every, every 
uh, pre court proceeding? Is that part of the uh, electronic? Uh, what did you just you mean say? A recording of the proceedings? No, no, no. I want the actual docket sheet from every court proceeding that I've had in dealing with this matter. Well, you'll have to address that to the clerk of court. I did. I, okay, I sent so the then that's why it didn't come to me, and I wouldn't seen it. I'm not oh. the custodian of the, the record. It's the clerk of court under the statute. So, um, I don't know, but I can find. That's not her problem. And out, um, and on. Why are you offering that, to direct Teresa, to find out from the clerk of court Ugh. if she received that ridiculous she'll request? She'll respond in due course. It was. It was addressed to. Uh, Miss Monica Paz. Okay, then why are you asking her? All right, anything else then? Nothing. Other than what we've already talked about. No. no. Okay. Okay, very well. They, uh, we'll have it <sighs> then when we bring the jury out. Okay, very well. Madam Clerk, please have the jury brought out. I think we all know that we need a break here. Okay. <sighs> we'll address the first witness of the day in a little while. I'm gonna take Harley for a walk. She has been lurching around the back behind me with her clickety clickety toes that I have not cut in a while. She's angry with me because I won't take her to the dog park. We'll take her to the dog park because I think she has some parasites. I think she has some parasites because it's been raining. Dogs poop at the dog park. People don't pick up the poop. And uh, all those little puddles get, you know, I guess little poop particles. And I think she picked something up. So she's not going back until A, it dries up a little bit. And B, I get her to the vet to make sure. So that is my plan. But until then, she does get a three-mile walk every day. Do not think she is so spoiled. Do not think she is at all <laughs> suffering through this, okay? The dog gets a three-mile walk, okay? And either I put her on my attached to the bicycle and do it, or I walk her physically. I used to run her five miles a day. This dog gets so much attention, okay? She is fine, so don't come at me. All right. We will address Daryl later. Thank you so much for joining me. I enjoyed the comments last night. And yes, you are all right. I was so much more calm at the beginning of this. I'm just, I'm starting to lose it every time he opens his mouth. I just can't. All right. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. This is Patty Jo. Uh, if you want to contribute to Walk the Shaw in the permanent memorial fund i believe i do have the correct uh link there if you wanted to do that that would be great and everybody have a great and safe day